All right, uh, we have returned to open session. Uh, first item on the agenda is uh, Welcome to Ames School by Principal Todd Gearman. Good evening, District 96 Board of Education, Superintendent Dr. Ryan Toy. Welcome to Ames Elementary School and our new multi-purpose room. Uh, if you would have told me three or four years ago we were envisioning this new Ames, which I often will call the Ames campus because it's so large, that the first time we're going to use the multi-purpose room was for a board meeting on October 7th, <laughs> I'd say, get out of here, no way, we're going to have students eating lunch here. So, you know, different times, call for different measures, but uh, welcome. Hopefully you were able to attend a tour with either myself and Dr. Ryan Toy or just Dr. Ryan Toy. I know I accompanied at several of you on tours. I uh, don't realize how much we really did to this building until I walked around with uh, Riverside TV this week, and uh, it was a Monday, and it took about an hour and 15 minutes to do a full tour of the building to talk about all the different aspects and all the different renovations and additions, and uh, we're looking forward to our uh, ribbon-cutting ceremony on October 29th, and we hope to have a good turnout for that. So welcome, and uh, thank you for being the first group to use this room. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Todd. Uh, at this time, is there any public comment? No emails? No? Okay. Uh, then are there any uh, changed, uh, proposed changes to the agenda? All right. No. All right. Then we'll move on to committee reports. Uh, the first committee is education. said I'm very excited about this video as well a video that just shares a typical day from different perspectives so you'll see our hybrid learners you'll see what our remote teachers are doing um, while hybrid learners are learning in the school um, all the credit for this video goes to Sarah Hickey our innovative learning specialist she's the one that put this together and uh, very appreciative of all her work and her efforts so here we go Riverside District 96 is a rainbow of possibilities. We know that we're seeing each other in a new way this year, but we're excited to see students, whether they're in person or remote. Students are always at the forefront of all of our instructional decision making. There are positive attitudes, hard work ethic, and willingness to try new things is exactly the mentality that propels the learning forward and has a shared investment across families, students and teachers in Riverside. We can't wait to talk to you all about how our day is here in District 96. Students begin each morning in a safe, socially distanced way outside of the schools. As they get their temperature checked, they are also checking to see that they were self-certifying at home. Students enter the building with excitement and even have a chance to wave at their teachers as they head in to get settled for the morning. If you were to walk the halls in the mornings, you would hear many teachers beginning their day with morning meeting routines. Morning meeting is an opportunity for students to share, contribute, and become part of their classroom communities. Each idea is valued, and as you can see, whether students are live streaming into the space or in person, they have the opportunity to share and become part of their communities. Building relationships as well as building in routines, create a classroom environment that allows for instruction to be effective. Teachers take time to teach nonverbal feedback strategies that allow students from any environment to be contributing members of the class. Ensuring that students are able to collaborate and communicate with each other has been an essential component of this year's instruction. Zoom, Google Classroom and Seesaw leverages the ability for students to share their knowledge with teachers and other students in their class. Math instruction is and continues to be a powerful opportunity for students to use manipulative 
as well as utilize discussion in order to deepen conceptual understanding of math concepts. We are also utilizing interactive lesson opportunities like Pear Deck to ensure that all students are able to share their thinking and learn from each other. The creation of anchor charts allows students to contribute to the learning and it allows for the learning to become visible and it allows it for it to grow day over day in order to take this knowledge and apply it to new situations. As much as possible, students are able to head outside and utilize the outdoor learning spaces at each school. In addition to outdoor learning, students have the ability to participate in brain breaks and movement breaks, as well as chances to reconnect with friends and chat. In addition to our math instruction, ELA or English Language Arts has also been prioritized within our school day to ensure that students have the appropriate amount of time to read, write, and research. Students participate in digital and non-digital versions of this reading and writing. We are also taking advantage of cross-curricular opportunities to promote this skill set. Within the science class, and for example, students have been writing scripts and collaboratively working on a Wii video project in order to present their thinking to their classmates in this innovative way. At primary, teachers are also leveraging technology to practice sounding out words and word families. Students then have the opportunity to share this thinking with others as a way to continue to enhance their ability to communicate their knowledge and share what they're learning. Most specials, encore classes, and small group instruction components are happening in a fully remote math method. Although it may look different this year, the engagement is still a top priority as students participate in synchronous and asynchronous learning opportunities. In both of these environments, students are getting their bodies and brains moving and thinking deeply about these encore learning opportunities. Students end each day with a smile, a wave, and an excitement for the next day of learning. Each familiar, friendly face is one that is part of our collaborative team that makes Riverside schools and community such a unique place to learn and grow. We are excited to continue this school year with rigorous academic expectations, as well as putting relationships and social emotional development the forefront of our decision making and learning opportunities. Thank you for being the continued support that we need in order to ensure that this year is a success, no matter what the 2021 school year brings us. Thank you very much. I just want to make a comment on a question, but um, it was a very well done video, I agree. And also just, you know, the fact that we're, we have some staff that are really, uh, you know, engaged in, um, in educating our students is so obvious from this. And it really makes me happy to, that our community and our, and our schools are, you know, putting in the effort to actually keep, in, keep the schools open because it's so important for our kids, you know, to have some ability to connect with their with their you know fellow students and you know for learning and all the rest so i think i'm really happy that you know you guys have done that so well thank you uh yes kind of combined combined looks like yes we have finance and facilities as the next committee Long range update seems to be the first item. I don't know if, if uh, Jeff or Joel want to give this any introduction or if you just want Jim and I to kind of jump in on this. But um, a couple weeks ago or months ago, I guess, really, um, a request came from the board if we could do kind of a recap and revisit um, where we are now in terms of our long range facilities and with the substantial completion of the construction work that was done over the spring and summer. So, um, Jim, I'll just kind of start and I think for the board, um, you're familiar, but to kind of for the community and to put this back in context. And as uh, Todd mentioned, I think three or four years ago, and it has been that long that 
the strategic plan that, plan that was developed back in 2016, uh, during the 2015-2016 school year, as a matter of fact, um, identified these specific goals about needing to optimize and reconfigure space to address the needs of the school district, um, specifically also relocating the district office and um, preparing for if we were to proceed with full day kindergarten and just improve the safety, accessibility, appropriateness of outside play and learning areas. So those really became the big areas, the goal areas that guided this work. Um, we jumped into this obviously a little more in earnest with specific goals during the 1920 school year. I don't know, Don has the clicker there. Um, that these were our specific goals that by then we had identified that it was this addition and renovation of Ames School, addition of a classroom and a secured front entrance for Blythe Park Elementary, renovation of the previous district office, which be, has become a multi-purpose room for Central School and securing the front entrance at Central School in a uh, new and unique and uh, really what we felt improved way. And then um, addition of a multi-purpose room at Hollywood and securing the front entrance and creating some more small group learning spaces. And as we know, we created the secured front entrance and the additional small group learning spaces at Hollywood um, and the multi-purpose room was, was delayed while we worked through uh, an agreement around the property. So. Um, the next slide, we again had a process that as we said has been multi-year working with our facilities advisory committee and most recently that's been uh, Joel Marhul and Linda Murphy serving on that as our two board members. Um, really focusing on those strategic plan goals, getting the feedback that we had from the community survey and um, informal community input along the way. Um, as you all recall, we updated our demographics within trying to really understand if the district was uh, going down in enrollment, staying the same or going up. Um, we uh, partnered with DLA Architects, and then we also had specific focus groups. Um, there was an Ames Visioning Committee that then really kind of, the vision that they set around how they really wanted learning um, to look like here in the 21st century. Um, the feedback that we got from Ames staff and Ames teachers really kind of guided the other work at the other schools as well. So um, we set a very specific set of uh, priorities then that we really look to guide us in all of our work and will continue to guide us in future work potentially as well. Um, that all schools, we wanted all schools to have a secured front entrance. We wanted to account for all itinerants, student support, small group learning areas at all schools. We wanted the right number of classrooms that could even include a full day kindergarten program, a place to eat and conduct large group projects as we sit here in the Ames multi-purpose room. Um, leveraging the new property acquisitions, and as this board knows well, there were two specific residential properties that um, became available and were purchased by the district, and I think we're now kind of sitting in one of those areas. Um, the goal was really to use those new property acquisitions to alleviate overcrowding across all schools, that it um, became clear to us throughout this process and really early in the process that there were district-wide problems that we could solve um, by having this additional space here at Ames. Um, and one of them was to relocate the early learners um, from Blythe Park to Ames School, and we're kind of sitting just off the early learners area here, and you can kind of tell by the bright colors in the setup in those classrooms, which we really love. Um, the other one was to separate play and parking that, uh, as I always say, there's kind of a unique uh, recess setup that seemed to be a District 96 thing that we, ki kids were sort of carefully taught how to play between parked cars, and staff knew not to move cars, I and mean, we did this all with safety in mind, but it's really nice to see where we've been able to just completely separate the play and parking and really that really enhances the play spaces and the outdoor learning spaces um, and then renovate and reconfigure library media centers as we and this is again we've reconfigured that space but at our school is really looking at the purpose in the library learning media centers and um, that this is an area about uh, research and potentially <coughs> steam work etc so um, that's still a work in progress and as you know we're using our libraries kind of unfortunately very differently this year during the um, COVID-19 pandemic. So with that, I think, Jim, you're going to jump into more of the costs and um, process steps that, that get into a bit more of the detail here. Right. In uh, February of 2018, DLA Architects compiled a long list of uh, capital improvement projects, major and minor maintenance uh, projects. And if you can see from the small table here that capital improvement projects in that list were estimated at just over $15 million. And the major maintenance projects combined with all the very uh, detailed um, smaller maintenance issues were about $8 million. Uh, a couple of life safety items to take care of and um, then there was uh, about $5 million in contingency and fees worked into that budget for a grand total of 
almost $28 million. And that was in February of 2018. This is a list of the $15 million in uh, capital projects that came off of that, that came from that list. Uh, tied it back even with the page numbers there. So if, if you still have your original manual, they're in there. Um, we added uh, most, for this purposes of this presentation, I added all the contingency and fees to the capital projects, feeling that most fees and contingencies were gonna be on these major capital items. Um, when I redo the whole list and update it, we'll probably sp uh, spread that around to uh, more of the maintenance items too. Uh, like a major maintenance item that was on there was a Blythe Park roof then that would have fees and contingencies to it. So um, this $19 million was where we kind of started at, can we afford to do this? And that's when we started looking at projections and taking it out of fund balance and you know not borrowing it. Um, and then, so starting with that number, the project evolved over the next year or two until we actually started the construction. I'm gonna ask Ramesh to, to go into more detail on the projects that we just completed, or almost completed. So when the capital improvement program began in 2019, we identified the five projects that Martha talked about, and we went out to bid in uh, late November, early December, and we came up with bids that were within budget for the outlays that we had for the projects that we had set up. And then of course, uh, we ended up with the pandemic which changed the sequence of operations and we had a, start, a delayed start to the construction project in uh, mid-January. We had to split the con construction projects into different packages to try and make sure that we could start the project and see how we could proceed. But the key on that was to arrive at a guaranteed maximum price with Berglund for the construction in 2019-2020, which was the 16257543, million which was significantly under our overall budget when we, as we started out the project. We also negotiated uh, DLA's fee as per the board guidelines, and we brought that number within, uh, uh, within our limits. Then we had uh, consultants, the testing and inspections, which is a $672,000 number. This included all the environmental testing, the surveys, the steel concrete testing, and the owner's representation fees, uh, all loaded into that number. And the miscellaneous purchases and, mis and um, purchases included furniture, the playground equipment, and uh, essentially trying to bring the whole project into um, its overall perspective. And you can see the total encumbered value is about $19 million. Next slide, please. So um, this is an important slide to talk about because these are what I call the throw-off projects from the capital improvement program that we began um, earlier this year. So the central storm and sewer sump pit project was the interior project that we ran into when we, fought, we tried to connect uh, the sanitary line inside the building. It was discovered that the line did not exist and had to be created from scratch. This is which ran beyond, uh, between the swimming pool all the way into the space adjacent to the multi-purpose room. We had to run through that whole section and we had talked about this at the June board meeting so this work was, and when they started doing that, we realized that we did not have foundation. We had to underpin the structure of the, project, of the building. And the initial idea was that we would be able to absorb the costs within the contingency of the project. But Berglund br brought back to us and said this was totally new scope and they did not account for it. So they asked us to carry it outside, but the work is complete because it's part of the central construction. Um, DLA requested additional services for, uh, for line item one, that was one of the parts that they had, and they listed three or four other uh, components as well for which they needed to be compensated. 
we have not paid them for their services, but this is, in, I mean, I'm showing as a separate line item at this time. The central utility relocation and tie-in was a throw-off project as well because um, when we started doing the exterior work at Central, we initially thought we could use the combined storm and sewer project um, drain lines to connect to the village lines in the street. But we found that we could not do that anymore because village code has changed. They asked us to separate the two lines within our property from a combined sewer to a separate storm and a sanitary line, number one. Number two is the line was going in what we call the uh, the root section of the major uh, three or four major trees at Central. We had to avoid them, but these are very large section, very large trees, and the root section would be damaged if we had run the lines through there. There were significant lines. These are like 12 and 15 inch RCP pipes that were going through in that section. So it would truly damage the tree. And so the architect and the engineer looked towards relocating some of these lines. And we've been investigating this, believe me, it's taken almost two months of investigation and surveys to finally come up with a design that saves the trees, is acceptable to MWRD and acceptable to the village. They're, requi they're requiring us to separate all our combined sewers and storms into separate lines. And there's a significant additional cost that's coming up for this one. We're in the process of negotiating that cost right now. I've just shown you what Berglund sent to us. Um, I met with them earlier this week and we are looking to bring that number down significantly. We're working on that. The last item in there is the Central Fire Protection Maintenance Project. As we were wrapping up the project at uh, Central uh, in the basement area, we opened up some of the sprinkler heads and we noticed that they were clogged, so we replaced those heads. A throw-off of this project was that we decided to look at all the heads in Central and essentially over the next uh, eight weekends, we're looking towards basically disconnecting each of the heads, cleaning the system, and putting the heads back in there, along with the introduction of a nitrogen generator. The current system at Central is 70 years old. It's not been replaced in that period of time. The fire pump is 70 years old. It's past its useful life. It needs to be picked up at, as a project in the near future. But the introduction of nitrogen in the system will help um, lengthen the lifespan of the pipes because it'll eliminate the presence of moisture in the lines. And that's a huge plus by adding the generator. So it's a smaller cost in this, but it'll help us uh, push back some of the added maintenance that we could, and we would have to end there right now if we did nothing. So this, these are two projects that we would like you to consider as, as projects that we need to proceed on fairly quickly in fact, like this weekend is when we wanted to start the emergency, uh, the fire protection maintenance project. It's important we start doing that because it's a weekend project, essentially. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah. Regarding the fire safety, you've seen that Central and Hauser essentially share a lot. I'm sorry. Central and Hauser share a lot. Is it possible that, I mean, should we also be checking, I guess this is a question of the board, should we also be checking Hauser's? Uh, uh, Hauser's got a wet system, so a different system. It does, okay. So the two buildings, unfortunately, have different systems, a wet and a dry. Central has a dry system, which, is, which has to be looked at. Okay. And it's past maintenance in the past uh, few years, but this time, because we actually opened up the line, mm -hmm. we found this uh, slime plug in there, and we decided to place the head okay. in the process. Thank you. Nanash, can yes. you talk about the integrity of the lines themselves? Uh, are they functional just with the nitrogen treatment? Is that the assumption that's being made? Yes, the lines are good for right now. Okay. okay? And the introduction of the nitrogen in the system will help prolong their life. But eventually, when we switch the system, we're going to switch to a wet system. We would not do a dry system in a conditioned space anymore in this day and age. So we have to look at it that way. At that time, we'd have to replace all the pipes and a new fire pump. Right. It's a fairly major project. Yeah. And how, much, how much longer will this give us with the dry system? So uh, I spoke to Berg about this. The introduction of nitrogen is a huge plus because if we had not done that, we'd be looking at a project that needs to be done the next couple of years. Okay. But by introducing nitrogen, we are trying to extend it to at least five to 10 years. And the cost of the nitrogen system is relatively low. 
it's about $22,000, and it's saving us from spending half a million. So that you've got you've got a quote there for three hundred eighty thousand, which you are negotiating down. But I guess look, just looking at the size of that initial quote, it's still going to be a substantial number. Absolutely. Yes. Um, I appreciate that you're trying to save the trees, and I totally love trees. Um, but um, for three hundred eighty thousand, we could just buy a lot of trees. How much of this is like? Is there an alternative route that would be less expensive at this point and would maybe sacrifice a tree and we could buy more trees? I mean, what, I'm, I'm just wondering what, whether there are other options other than the, the one that you're now considering, which looks like it's going to be very expensive. Right. Uh, we did look at other options. We looked at going between the two trees, but then the village stepped in and said they would not let us tie in at the appropriate location. The introduction of at each time you turn and make a bend on the line, you need to introduce a new structure sure. in there. And those structures were starting to fall on uh, properties outside our control. And they would not let us do that. So we straightened the line and went past the trees. I mean, now the run is almost 400 feet as compared to being 75 feet. So that's part of the equation that we're running into problems with. And every time we ran the lines, and we reached a spot where we could tie into the village, they said no. Okay. They said no, you cannot connect out here. They asked us to keep moving down because they wanted us to, to tie into existing structures. They did not want us to create a new structure within their system. Okay. And that's part of the reason why the price has kept on escalating. This has been under design for almost two months. When we ran to this problem in July, we thought we had a solution. When we, I think I talked about this by going between the two trees. And we thought we would have that solution. But the village stepped in and said they wouldn't let us tie in. Okay. Yeah. And they said, and then MWRD came in and said, you need to separate your two systems. You have to have a separate storm and a sanitary line. And the connections for those being separate uh, require two tie-ins instead of one. Should that be a concern? Do we need to look at those at all? We have a maintenance contract that happens every year where they're inspected by a fire protection company. Mm -hmm. So those, I mean, I'm not sure how extensive their inspections are. But in this case, what we found was because we actually disconnected the heads, we, could, we actually saw what the problem is. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure the maintenance contracts require them to remove the heads. They may just pressurize the system, test the pump, and say well, it's working. That's what I'm concerned about. Yes, it's obvious. Okay. I mean, the fire protection systems have a lifespan, okay? And so if we look at it, Central had one of the oldest systems. It was 70 years old. 1960s is when the pump was installed. That pump, it's functional right now, by the way. We had it tested two weeks ago. We confirmed it's working. But when will it fail? It's, we don't know yeah. because it's past its lifespan. Yeah, okay. Yes. Have you had any response from them regarding the project with the, the lines out front and central? Yes, yes. We got responses back from them earlier this week. Oh, they have approved the project great. and they have asked us to make more modifications. Okay. So that was included in this process. So when I met with Berglund, one of the things was that the project went from 10 days to 43 days. Wow. Okay, I mean, the length of the project kept on getting bigger, it means more cost. So that's what we're trying to bring down right now to say that we need to finish this in about 20, 25 days. Right. That'll bring down the cost. So that's what we are really negotiating right now, trying to reduce the manpower and overhead. Uh, I, I do have a question regarding this, this tie-in. Um, and I don't know if you can answer this for me, but what, what's the reason why didn't they want this? Why wouldn't they let us create another like, catch basin or, or tie-in, excuse me, another tie-in? Um, what was their reasoning for that? Um, most villages don't allow combined sewers in this day. That's my understanding also. That means you're not allowed to combine sanitary and, and storm into the same line. I could be wrong on this, but essentially law, I mean, rules and lines have changed over time. Initially, it was a money-saving uh, issue that you combine the sewers, you only had to do one line. But now you are required to do two separate lines. Maybe, maybe, maybe. 
Yeah, so like you said, we, it was like 75 feet, and then we had to, we had to end up going for 400 feet. But why couldn't we like create those two separate lines at 75 feet? I mean, what was the rationale for the village for not letting us? They just won't let us connect directly into those lines the way they run into Woodside Road. We have to connect elsewhere. And also what happens is you need to uh, account, uh, account for a slope in the line so that you have positive drainage mm -hmm. into the uh, end point where you're connecting to. If you can't get that slope, you would have to either dig or you'd need to pump, one mm -hmm. of the two things you've got to do. We can't achieve either of those two by in the 75 feet connection, so we are actually running the lines parallel to the building and making a tie-in elsewhere. Okay. There were numerous uh, <coughs> options that we looked at, and each time we got to a solution, we had to find that we had to satisfy MWRD, we had to satisfy the village, and the engineer at the same time. All three had to be uh, had to sign off that this is acceptable. Mm -hmm. it, it really took a long time to get to a solution that's acceptable to all of us. Can I ask just one last question? When do you anticipate both beginning and completing the utility relocation potential? Um, the idea is to start next week. Okay. Okay, and then it's 43 days after that. So we're looking through the end of November, so early December. Thanksgiving? Yes. But as I said, I'm looking to expedite the project. So uh, the point is that if we get uh, approval, we want to hit it as hard as we can before the weather turns on us, mm -hmm. and we want to get it done as quickly as possible. And as I said, we may switch to a TNM process on some of these time and material mm -hmm. to keep the cost down, because that's the outer edge of the number, yeah. and we are looking to bring that num number down significantly. That's really the goal. And there's a lot of investigative cost inside that number, too. How confident are the engineers that by adding this nitrogen to the system, that's the system is going to work robustly? I mean, somebody said it was a very old system, and there, there are certain things where we, we want to economize on money. I, I think sprinklers is not one of them. Um, are they very confident that it's going to be a robust system in case something were to happen, or uh, what's the what's the thinking on that? Yes. So we did a test project two weeks ago. We, uh, on Saturday, we had them dismantle about five to six heads on different floors. We took them apart to see what the condition of the pipe was and the condition of the heads. The heads were in good shape. The pipe was in relatively good shape, considering that it had sludge in it. It had this debris in it. So the engineer said the pipe's in good shape for right now, but it cannot support a wet system. If we okay. switch to a wet system in the future, we would have to replace them. So the idea was how do we prolong the dry system to get the best bang for the buck? And the way out was to introduce a nitrogen generator. If we had just put the heads back, it would have gotten clogged in another two years' time again. You would have had more debris and sludge inside. So, so this at least buys you five to eight years. Okay. And maybe we replace the fire pump in between. It buys us more time. But if we've got to do the entire system, we're looking at a half a million dollars. When you say nitrogen, is that the sort of nitrogen then is what suppresses the fire? You're saying there's a put nitrogen? No. No? No. no, it's no. in the pipe. It's pumped into the pipe. It yep. displaces the air. So what happens is nitrogen does not have moisture in it. It's dry. So it prevents corrosion and it prevents the sludge from forming that would, would enter into the head. OK, so it's still water system, slow water system. A dry system. Oh, it's a water system for the sprinklers are water still. Yes. Yeah. One, if a fire comes in, yes, it would yeah. pump water right through. Okay. Correct. Many times more effective than just leaving that sludge and that water in there because you're going to push all that out. The nitrogen is purely to reduce or eliminate corrosion. Yes. That's it. Yes. Thank you. So the dry system just means there's no water in the pipe, okay. so the air has to be pushed out. It's all pushing the water into the system, and then so it'll take a few minutes to get all the air out. In this case, nitrogen, and then the water will fire. Whereas a wet system, the water's there and it goes off immediately. What, what then drives the potential replacement from a dry to a wet system? Is it just the fire pump? Is it? No. The main thing is that you would not build a dry system in this day and age because we already have conditioned space. You normally have put in a dry system in an attic, for example, which is not conditioned where you could have a freeze-thaw cycle no. in effect. So this being a dry system, 
we would replace it with a wet system, which in the long run is far more effective and cheaper to maintain. This is a stopgap measure, essentially. But again, what, is, what drives the replacement? When, does, when do we decide that this system that's currently being maintained and extended in its life to a reasonable point, what then causes us to say it's time to replace this dry system? Two things. I believe if the fire pump fails, if the, it reaches, I mean, if next time it's being maintained in say two or three years, if the um, fire protection uh, company comes and says, your pump's done, that's your first trigger. The second one would be if they, we would recommend that they open up heads at that time to just check to see if there's any more sludge forming in there. Okay. If there is sludge forming or some kind of degradation that's taking place, that shows that it's time that you need to replace it. But it's a major project because you have to drop ceilings, you right. have to replace pipes. The major pipes have to be replaced. It's big. Okay, thank you. That was, it was at what point forces us into the replacement process? Correct. Thank you. Do you have any of those back? Are you on the left side? It's all wet. Oh, okay. All other schools are wet. So for these, these stopgap measures that we're doing right now with the, the nitrogen uh, pump that you mentioned, or if we had to replace the overall pump, would any of that be useful or helpful to a new system, or has it essentially just become? It'll be done. Yeah. I mean, the nitrogen system is about 22,000 to 22, for the uh, generator and about four or 5,000 to install. So that would be, because we're switching to a wet system, we don't need the nitrogen anymore, so we, it would go away. But the rest of our system is all replacement, 100% replacement. We can't salvage anything other than you know, really the main lines, the way, the distribution system will be exactly the same, but you have to replace the pipes. They're 70 years old, and if it's a wet system, you need new pipes. Uh, yes? I don't think we've ever had a problem with first fire pipes, but if, if essentially if all that moisture is gone, you get nitrogen, you've got an additional protection against freezing temperatures if something were to happen with the temperature of the building. Is that correct? You wouldn't have pipes bursting? It's a dry system, so yeah. there's no question. Yeah. Okay. So can I just interject here, and Ramesh, help me? So it's the it's the central fire protection system that we would like to use this this upcoming long weekend to address um, because there's an urgency to this one. Um, I I wasn't thinking about the central tie-in, but help me. One of the things we had talked about with our attorney is if the board is comfortable with us proceeding, because this is, does not require us to take it out to bid because it's sort of part of the Berglund projects that remain, um, but it does require, because of the dollar amount, it would require board approval. So one idea would be that the board could share having enough of a comfort level to allow us to proceed this upcoming weekend with the fire protection system um, updated update. Um, and then we would ratify an agreement at the October 21st board meeting. Correct. I don't know if that's necessary for the central tie-in project. No, for the central, uh, the uh, utility work also we need to start because we'll run into cold weather otherwise. Okay, so we so would both want- Both these we would like to start, but the idea is that to get the negotiated costs down, I think I'm much closer on the fire protection system. In fact, I think I have an agreement with them. We managed to reduce that number by almost 15%, brought that down. but. Uh, the other one, I don't have an agreement yet because they need to go back to the subs. And that can be completed over the weekend by the time the kids come back on Monday? No. There are eight uh, working days. We're getting three of them this weekend on the Columbus Day, but there are other five Saturdays. Then you're going to use the weekend. Right? If you finish earlier, you're going to get the credit back on it in the same proportion. There's a possibility of it of us getting it done earlier too. But that's the eight weekends, eight working days is what we're looking at. So it's not really an action item because it's not set up to be that way, but is, it, is there sort of general consensus that this is work that, support for work moving into this work this weekend? Yes, because this is, yeah. we've got a full three day weekend. This, get, this allows the contract to really get a head start on this. I'll we'll probably have a good idea about what this true work day requirement will be to some degree, correct? Yes, yes. 
don't think we should mess with life safety issues. And it also has ramifications on insurance too. If something were to happen, and it seems unlikely, but um, I've seen my fair share of claims where you thought something was going to happen, and it does. So. Mm -hmm. No, this is let's just get this done. It sounds like there's consensus to move forward. So. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Ramesh, they could have the Tuesday too. Because it's a four day. Right. Because <laughs> it's Institute Day. Because right. it's Institute Day. Yeah. So. Well, the day will work Sunday. I, that's like, I wasn't sure when he said three. No, it's okay. not Sunday. Is yeah. that how it works? Okay. No, so they, they're taking the Tuesday. Uh, it costs double time on Sunday. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. So it's Saturday, <laughs> Saturday, Monday, Tuesday. Right. Okay. Well, I forgot to mention that all those are Saturday, but really expensive. So uh, last October, as we were pulling all the capital projects off the list from that original long range plan, and it kind of took a life of its own and it went the direction and we did so many iterations on it. And in the same time, we were knocking off some of the smaller maintenance um, issues. And one of the bigger ones was the Blythe Park roof that was uh, finished even before this. So I had uh, DLA architects update everything from that original list. And of course, some of them were completed and some things got added. And um, I intend to have that. I, I've been using that in the budget and I'll have uh, an updated list for you with projections coming up soon. And um, some of the things that are, I mean, this is where we make sure we're maintaining our roofs and boilers and some specific projects that we have in our maintenance plans is uh, to improve the sound and lighting in uh, the Hauser Auditorium, to at least replace or repair the Blythe parking lot, but at the same time look at whether there's some improvements that should be made while we do this. Um, if possible, there's a, there's a rooftop unit that really looks a bit out of place on top of Ames and uh, a suggestion was made if we could try and screen that off, but we'll see what something like that costs. Um, the uh, district office building could use a facelift with paint, and of course the central sprinklers and then the fire pump that Ramesh was telling you about. And then on the other oh, half- Jim, the, uh, you hold up a moment to the previous screen. So right now for the Hauser Sound and Light and the Blythe Park and the Ames RTU screen, we haven't really figured out what the scope of those projects potentially could be, correct? Correct. Okay. Because the, the RTU screen is really just an aesthetic issue and it's not a maintenance issue based on the emails that we received yes. from public comment. Correct. Is that for HVAC? Is that an HVAC system on top that's just unsightly, or what? What is it that we're Correct. I believe yes. Okay. Yes. From a previous project, it was not part of this project. It'll, okay. Yeah, I think there was HVAC for this project that was screened. Yes, uh, but I think we had one before. One, yeah, that's yeah. closer to the front of the building as it faces the street. Okay. I think I heard it's been up there for thirty years, perhaps. Right. Is this from a residence or? And they're in the neighbor, yeah. Yeah. So the things coming up uh, for capital improvements are the continue to look at the central Hauser campus. Um, we still have the preliminary uh, study going on. Um, that's with the uh, facility advisory committee right now. And uh, a couple of capital items that got postponed from our large. Uh, program, the Hollywood Multipurpose Room and Playground. Uh, we did have a bid on it as a part of the large package and uh, of course that expired and we'll need to rebid that. And just for reference, the previous bids up here, we'd expect to lose um, a lot of the economy of scales and, and perhaps some inflation. So the number I'm carrying with me is 1.9 million. So can I ask Ramesh a question? Based on that previous bid, is there a guess as to how much more it may require because we've lost the economy scale? Has yes, I actually did provide a breakdown of numbers to uh, Jim Bobbitt, that's what he mentioned, the 1.9. Okay. 
the reason why it in, inflates so heavily is because uh, as it's a much smaller project, number one. So we lose that aspect. The second aspect is we would have re-engaged the architect again to get the operational services because his contract would expire. He does not have services in this number. This was just a construction number. Okay. Then we have, again, the testing, the concrete testing, all that has to be added separately to this number. And it will add up. And we would not recommend going the CM route for this point. We would recommend going the lump sum. Just a straight out bid. Yeah, lump sum, yeah. The project is the right size. We could get a lump sum bid and finish it next year. Okay. So, so we're looking at essentially $600,000 more. Is that hearing you correctly? I mean, that's what we're projecting right now because you have to re engage all the mm -hmm. Oh, no, you yeah, know, I, I just. That's a. It's a heck of a lot of money for. It's a thousand square feet, right? So that's a few thousand dollars a square well, feet. I'm not saying we don't. I'm not saying we don't do this, but I'm just. I, I just. When all those discussions we were having, I, I'm sorry with, with like DHC about this. This is this whole thing is now costing us an extra potentially an extra six hundred thousand dollars. I'm I'm just a little astounded by that. So we could also we could come in our favor too by going in for a simple bid. The number may come down. It's possible, but I'm just saying, projecting it out based on the fact that we could re-engage uh, the archetype. Yeah, I, like I said, I'm not I'm not arguing that we shouldn't do this. I'm not arguing about the cost. I'm just I, I am arguing about the cost, but I'm just <laughs> the economies of scale are like significant, and I'm just I'm like I said, I'm just six hundred thousand dollars. That's just, <laughs> that's a heck of a lot of money. So. Take so the next steps would be to uh, celebrate the accomplishments from this program, and uh, there'll be uh, there'll be a ribbon cutting on October 29th at 3 p.m. And our facility facility advisory committee will continue to meet, although the scope of the projects we're looking at will be a little smaller. And um, we've been uh, having meetings and with the uh, anticipation of working on a new strategic plan. And we intend to address the long range maintenance projects and consistent with our financial goals and agreements. I have a quick question just to go on to the top of the, the celebrate the current accomplishments. I heard earlier Mr. Newman had said something about RBTV videoing it. Is that gonna be released to the public or? Or what is the purpose of that? Sure. So RBTV had reached out, and um, they knew that we weren't inviting people into our <laughs> buildings uh, with open arms given the pandemic. So they offered to do a video tour of our new spaces. So they are they are doing that actually this week at all four of the schools that have had the additions and renovations done. So the thought is we'd put it up on the website, um, and we can think about other ways that we can push it out. But it was it's absolutely for kind of community. Yeah, yeah. Use I know you had mentioned see. it. I was just wondering what yeah. the plan was. I think that's I think that really nicely fits in with the celebrating the current accomplishments. Yeah. So I look Certainly forward to. And for those of us that don't have children, and it's just at school, it's really neat to see though how and maybe I don't know if Mr. Graham is commenting on the video about specifics. I'm sure you are, but that's really neat to hear if you were a resident or just what's happening. So thank you. I think RBTV, um, you post all your videos on a site that's linked through the Village website, is that right? Or that's right. It's, so it's publicly available that way, we'd make it publicly available on our own website, and then I think even principals could include it in their newsletters, and yes. I think we just Fantastic. think of a variety of ways to use it. It's a great idea, thank you. it the um, finances a little bit because I think there's still some uh, loose ends that would be good to tie up I mean these projects are very complicated they're multi-year they're moving pieces and uh, it, it's very hard even if you're really following closely to know what was spent on what and when and how, how it all puts together so I'd really like to tighten up um, you know just just on a simple one page for the capital projects you know what what we what we spent 
what we thought we were going to spend, you know, and, and do a kind of a post-mortem. So it's not going to be a complicated document. It's not going to be 100 pages. It'll be one page. Just, but just so we know exactly where we stand, and also with respect to um, projects that have not been finished. So we can say, okay, we're we'll finished this, we haven't finished that, and that still would be determined. So just, I would like to have something like that, and I could work with uh, Mr. Fitton on that. And then the same thing for, uh, as you mentioned, the maintenance projects. We've done one big maintenance project at Blythe and start a document for that as well. So what I'm thinking is like tying this back to the long range plan and making it a living document. So we're, we sort of are constantly going back and saying, okay, this is what we did, and this is how it turned out, and this is, you know, maybe we have, need to add different things, but just just fleshing out the financial picture better so it's easy to understand what happened. Because right now, I, I'd be totally honest. I mean, there's you know many many presentations and what's in what's in this, what's not in this. It's very you, hard to know. So. And you're meaning like the big, the big, the big picture. Well, I, I was oh. the big no, picture like in terms big, of like um, yeah items. exactly. So like there's 19 yeah. items on the uh, master facility plan for for the capital expenditures that that. Uh, Mr. Fitton has listed here, like the Ames edition, like mm -hmm. the allowance for Ames playground equipment, and we've seen we've seen all these bits and pieces, you know, here and there, throughout the process. But we don't have them collected, at least I, as far as I know, in one simple place, mm -hmm. alongside with, you know, the expected cost and, and, and so forth. So I, I think we really just can tighten that up, make it easy to understand, so we can all have a better understanding of you know where we stand on that. So. If people are in agreement, that's what I would like to propose for the next finance meeting in, in November, if that's okay. So what, if I understand what you're saying. So you, like something for, for each of these 19 items, essentially, what was the initial proposed yes. cost? What did the final cost yes. end up to be in as much as we can uh, attribute or find out yep. what was the difference for the variance? Oh, exactly. Yeah. And that, yes. plus what's still expected, because we mm -hmm. still have what is potentially something between 1.3 and 1.9 million for Hollywood. Right, exactly. So that would be like the pre-mortem and the sort of current state of affairs, and then and then for the, the new projects, um, you know, some of the projects that are new that, that uh, Ramesh is talking about were not anticipated, and that's going to happen, as we know, with the with the uh, facility plan. There are be things that come up you didn't know about the sprinklers, you didn't know about the, right. the, the sewage and all that. But we have to keep track of those, I think, in the same way, so that we know, like, okay, why is that important? It's important because Mr. Fitton is using. DLA's projections about our uh, you know, maintenance cost to come up with the budget. And so if we're finding a lot of these projects are popping up that we hadn't anticipated, that has implications for our budget I, that I think we need to think about long range. So again, it's another reason I think we just have to have a, a tight handle on that or, you know, you know so that, right. that's kind of what I'm thinking. And for the, the long range aspect of this project, we're talking the big ticket items, we're talking the big yeah, I'm talking about the big ticket items. So I'm not talking about the, the, the doorknob or that sort right, of thing. Right, like see, <laughs> well, yeah, I'm just making sure because that, I, if I remember that long range thing was like hundreds there was, there of pages. There was everything down to like a So we're just talking there about like budget, 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 budget items. <laughs> items that are going to affect our budget. Yeah. Projects. Yes, I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, exactly. No, I, 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 can, I can definitely support that, absolutely. One question I do have because, I mean, we have a lot, there's, I'm just looking at, there's, there's a number of items on this list here, a few slides back. But I guess my question is, do, how do we want to how do we want to present it? I mean, do we want to present it by school or by project? Because right now, I, I'm thinking just from a, a, a standard of like maybe making it like high level and making it sort of uniform for all school like all schools. So well, like Ames, we expect to spend this much on construction facilities. Ames, we expect to spend this much on on furniture. Right. Just so that the, the if you look at the um, uh, and as I'm sure you have if you read the uh, the uh, Long Range Chile plan, they, they do exactly what we're talking about. So every school, they talk about like the addition, they talk about the playground, and it's right. like, not exactly the same, but more or less the same for each of them, the furniture. And so just, I would think that the, the natural way to do it is just, to, and there's some differences between the schools too, so you can't necessarily fit the So is that the, pre, the pre-mortem line, is that, is that's that the, the? That's the post-mortem for the, the capital stuff. So basically we're gonna use these, nine, I think we should just use the 19 categories that are already in the master facility plan. We might have to make a few adjustments because the plans evolve through time and all that, mm -hmm. but you know, I think that we can use that as the conceptual foundation mm -hmm. and that would allow us to compare mm -hmm. schools as right. well and then you know so I yeah. can't I, I can't recall that the way it's listed in there. Yeah. So for at that point when we were doing that plan, did we already have an idea of the pro, like the capital improvement projects? Like so the estimates that were in there. They're, they're, they, yes, more or less. They're more or less the same uh, okay. categories. 
Now the numbers. No, have changed. that's what I'm saying. The numbers. The numbers have changed. Basically. Yes. Okay, so you that's okay. But for so, example, Blythe, we said initially it was going to be seventy-five thousand for the entryway, and then we made it much more elaborate, and then you know, but but more more or less, the categories are the same. They're not. There's some mm -hmm. change, There are some differences, but we can address those, I think, in a rational way to make it clear. So. Right. I, I don't necessarily think comparing that original estimate in the long range facility plan for the Blythe entrance makes sense to uh, uh, comparing it to what we did spend. I mean, it makes sense in terms of this is what we thought before we even investigated and this is what we ended up right. with. But I don't think in terms of like, while we blew our budget. No, this, is, this, our, isn't, uh, this isn't a, um, no, I agree with you. This isn't an exercise in like, did we okay. meet that's, this? This is an exercise like, where are we? Okay, what, no, that's where, where do we think we're going to be? Where are we? And that's just for information, and it's like right. it doesn't mean like all. Oh, just you know, historical, like, yeah. So, but I think it's important for a board as, as fiduciary, you know, members of the we, we need to know that. You know, we, someone says to you, well, how much do you spend on the playground at at, at Ames? You, you need to know that, right? It's like that should be yeah. just you know in there. And again, that information has been floated around, but I, I I'd be hard. You just want it in one spot. One spot, clean analysis. Yeah. Right? yeah. And then I think it would also on that same term when you're talking about the long-term projects, like when we're talking about boilers that are on a cycle and yes. just, just having that all in one space. All in one spot, in one page, one page document, and, and then we should keep adding to it, you know, and, and do a pre-mortem so that when we're talking about like, you know, a new project, we can say, okay, what does it say on the long-range plan? What are we proposing now? Like right now, we know in five to eight years, we're going to have to be doing uh, the, the fire system at Central. Like, I'm sure that's, sure that's going to be added. I mean, so obviously the, the long-range plan has to be I mean, imagine but five years ago, boards, boards, boards change, and people are right. out about it. Who knows? That's totally important. I would have really appreciated that. Anybody, you know, right. if we knew right. that right. something was needed, right. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so, it's, it's something so it's okay to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Jim, is that, that systems something systems. you'd be able to, to work yeah. with Jeff on? Yeah. With Ramesh and, uh, and probably uh, Ryan, and we'll make sure we pull this together. We'll plan on that for the next meeting. Next meeting of the whole. Next meeting of the whole. Okay. Thanks. All right. Uh, anything else for finance and or facilities? All right, then next uh, agenda item in, and is the personnel committee. All right, uh, so now that we're all back in pre-med, mm -hmm. um, COVID testing. So I guess I'll just, uh, you know, just throw this over to oh, you or, okay. or, or Jeff or whatever, but um, basically we, we put it under here because it deals with people. It doesn't really have a clean fit in any one of the committees, but um, we got a, a plenty of additional information. Uh, some of the memos have been sent out. This one's attached here just about the costs and what District 102 is experiencing and things like that. So I'll, um, I'll hand it over to either you, Martha, or, or Jeff, or Joel, or, or whomever who's got more details on this than I do. I'll just do a brief intro, and then uh, Jeff, certainly feel free to jump in on this or, or anybody. So we've had some preliminary conversations about this idea of doing COVID-19, I don't know if it's officially COVID-19 testing, but um, testing that would give us a sense of uh, a clinical significance that resembles COVID-19 um, as a method for surveillance testing district-wide. It would be surveillance testing for both staff and for students. Uh, be offered to everybody free of charge and then people would have to give consent to participate so nobody would be forced to participate in the testing not any staff um, nor any students um, but it is as we know kind of a method that's being used as a way to um, sort of add another layer of, um, of safety in terms of keeping COVID-19 out of our school setting as uh, to the best of our abilities so it just can, comes up that uh, kind of uniquely District 102, which is one of our neighboring districts in the LaGrange Brookfield area, um, has an op is currently working with, um, they, ha they have a board member, as I think I've shared before, that um, is also a virologist uh, from Loyola Medical Center, and so has been able to set up a lab in District 102, and District 102 has offered us an opportunity to be one of their partners. Um, so again, it's something we've been talking about a little bit along the way, um, but w wanted to talk about in greater detail tonight and try to be as responsive as possible to um, any questions that the board has. And then also to consider kind of a timeline and how, if we're going to move forward, um, how, we, how and when we might want to do that. I, I do have a question before you jump in, uh, Jeff. Um, is, uh, you, you did say, Martha, you just said all testing for students, staff, faculty, and staff. Are you saying all including hybrid and remote or just? 
Well, that's a good question. So I have a known at LaGrange 102, they started with only their hybrid students because those are the students that could potentially be bringing COVID into the schools, that remote students, because they're all remote, it didn't seem to be as necessary. I do believe that there's been a request to also start t testing remote uh, students if they're interested. So I think that would be a question for us to consider. Do you want to immediately open it up to all or open it up just to hybrid? I did speak with the University of Illinois rep and he said that their recommendation to be doing in-person students for the time being just to get a baseline for that population, but we obviously have a community of people and so it could be something to be considered, but that's currently the recommendation. Mm -hmm. So just to add to what, what Mark said, um, uh, uh, so we've set up a very good system, I think, for our hybrid learners. Uh, so we followed all the recommendations where uh, everyone wears masks, We've reduced the density of students drastically by having half and sort of uh, splitting students up into uh, different groups and uh, having good hygiene and all of the other things that are doing outdoor stuff, you know, having good hygiene. Uh, and all those things are really good and important. Um, but uh, one, of the, one of the sort of um, insidious things about this, this particular virus is that it, uh, it oftentimes spreads with a sort of asymptomatic people. So that unlike most flus, unlike many disease, any infectious diseases, where it, it spreads, it's, in, it's, it's obvious that someone is infected or sick. With this disease, you could be infectious, but not know it, and no one else would know it. So uh, for that reason, it, it's thought by epidemiologists, it's important to identify, we can identify those people who are infectious but asymptomatic, and uh, you know, um, then if we can do that, we can sort of take them out of the pool until and quarantine them until they're you know no longer infectious, and that will reduce the possibility of having an outbreak you know in, in a school. So I think that's the motivation. People have uh, done simulations and they've shown that if you can test on the scale of twice a week or even once a week, which I think like the University of Illinois is doing. You can really put stop, really cut the transmission probably a lot. You know, by 90% if you do it twice a week, by 60% or if you do it once a week. So really big effect. So um, Joel and I met with uh, the Dr. Campbell, who's the board member that's put this together at 102 uh, about a week. That was what, last Sunday or yeah, week, week ago Sunday. And uh, one of our mutual friends invited us to meet him. And he seems like he's a very knowledgeable, very straight shooter. You know, set up the practical system. Very, you know, so he answered all our questions directly. And so I came away, I don't know about Joel, but I came away feeling very confident that his system is legit. You know, he's, so what he's doing is he's setting up this, this system at 102, which he said 105, just 105 is going to join them. Um, and then he's got a lot of interest from other districts in the Chicago area, like Naperville, like Kingsdale, and a bunch of other places that would like to be in it. But he can't set, he can't sort of set that, and do everything in the basement of 102 in that little laboratory. <laughs> so he basically said he's, he set up a company that's going to try to scale up the testing for you know multiple districts. Um, and but he said he hoped that our district could join the initial effort with 102. 105, because we're all kind of in the same geographical area. He said he'd like to do that, but he has to see, as they add 105, if they're going to have the, the ability to do that. Or do you guys, and if not, then they would allow us to join with the regular company. So that's that's kind of was the gist of our meeting. I don't know if you've got No, and that, that that's or, correct. His, his thought is that this represents a relatively consistent geographical area, and that's that's his primary goal. and. Clearly, he's got uh, larger goals with a company, but that's not what he's talking about with us. He's talking about an at-cost system, and everything that he spoke about was, it sounded reasonable based on what you know I know about the science of it. And um, he's, he's practical, and he's got a system that, that works and can, uh, it operates from both the theoretical sense in terms of the testing and the results he's getting, but it's also something that you can manage with the people that he's able to hire and right. the, the system he's got where right. he's looked at, for example, the, the middle school kids and 
when, it, when is an appropriate time to test them? Because they're the ones who he sees being taking the most risky behavior in terms of wandering around and being not socially Maybe distant. Great to scale up to, uh, to a <laughs> if they, if and when they go so they, they use a lamp test, which is a way of amplifying the RNA. It's similar to PCR, but it's less uh, less sensitive. But for screening, that's okay. Um, one thing that's really nice about this system is that it's very, very specific. Is they have had, I think he said, he told us, I believe, that they did like six or seven thousand tests. They have not had a single false positive yet in that group. Correct. So they had identified, I think, six or seven people who were positive that then subsequently were tested, tested. with PCR and found very positive. So. so isn't it true that like we, these are like the rapid tests? This one is not. This is not oh, the this is not, this is not well, It is rapid because they just do it rapidly. But, but it's, it's not the same. It's not, it's not the antigen test. Okay. Right okay. Which would be even better to be much, much cheaper, cheaper, but that's not yet on offer yet. Okay. Is there on the order of several hours? Or is it this one, I think, the same day. So they, yeah. uh, they, they get the results back, I believe, the same day. Or it's not insignificant when some of these places, it's all over the place. If you get one the same day, you can get a result yeah. from five to seven days. Right. Right. Which then, if for 10 days, the result is totally meaningless. Right. So my question was, um, with the, it's not the antigen test, right. which we have heard in the news, like, uh, if you're early on in your, your you might not have that viral load to to, 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 to basically. Is this similar in that way? Like it's similar in that way. <laughs> it's that uh, I think that um, like from what I read, the PCR test will test will find a thousand molecules per milliliter. This will find if, if you have a hundred thousand per milliliter, it, mm -hmm. it, it's, it will trigger. So it's less sensitive in that sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but the vast majority of the time, you're, um, you're there's only a short window because the virus replicates very rapidly right. in the body. There's only a short window of time right. you which you were in that interval. So okay. that, yeah, if you're in that interval, you miss it. Um, but um, so there, there is a situation. There is a yes. The, which, is, so, which is fine. Right, I'm so not, these I'm tests are not that. perfect, and we, as we know from watching the what's happening in, in Washington, that's what if I, you that's assume that like oh, okay, if I can't get tested, that's what I want to do. That even with good. this testing, we are still no, no, you have social to, distancing and masks. This is yeah, yeah, this is one as Martha said. This is one additional sure layer, one additional that. filter, yeah. but it's not it's not you can't sort of forget right. about it. Right. Uh, yes. Right. So it doesn't testing would not replace any no, of these. No, no, no. It would just be one additional way of identifying asymptomatic carriers. That's all we'd be doing. Yeah. The other thing I I and I mentioned this and I actually talked to the superintendent there again today because the other I think potential good thing that supports students and student learning is this idea of being able to test somebody that we are saying you have symptoms you need to go home they could be they, they resemble COVID which as we know almost every symptom that a child can come up with probably resembles COVID or could resemble COVID so I think we could get a, a quicker result and hopefully bring them back to school more quickly. So, yeah. um, now, what, what Dr. Schumacher was saying is if, if a child, let's say, or a staff member unit has a cough or multiple symptoms, they are often saying, go get a COVID test because you're going to need that firm diagnosis anyway. Um, but the runny nose and a couple sneezes where, again, out of abundance of caution, families are keeping kids home, it may take, again, the, the test that takes five to seven days, and now the child has missed five to seven days of school because maybe what was allergies or a cold, and it really wasn't COVID, it's a way to potentially get that um, not COVID, not COVID-like an answer. So they do test some symptomatic individuals then with, with greater frequency if wanted, needed. So is, that, is that more than one test then? You said with greater frequency, so. So I'm, what I'm saying is if every child and every consenting child and adult is tested once a week, if you then had a child where we could maybe give them a second test in that week because they're presenting with some symptoms. So that's a, that's an area that's, a, I think, a little bit gray to me because I, I, I understand what you're saying and I agree with you. But I think we also need to think very carefully about the possibility of a false negative. You know what I'm saying? Because we are not a medical facility. We're not. So if we were to give someone a test and say, you know, you're negative, because the test wasn't sensitive or we didn't get, we, we would then, I, I think there'd be some, some concern there with giving them that sort of, uh, in, in, in the case where you're talking about yeah. you're symptomatic people. So I think we really would need to think carefully about whether that's something we want to do uh -huh. because if people acted on that advice, 
let's say it, you said, oh, you're, you're okay, you're, you're yeah. negative, and then it turned out they were positive, that's, it's a very, I think, tricky area. On the other side of the coin, we're sort of, you know, false positive, that's not a problem, okay? Yeah. It, it's not a problem for the test, it don't seem to be yeah. a problem, but if someone's yeah. falsely positive, it's a hassle because they have to go and get another test, but mm -hmm. it's different mm -hmm. conceptually than a false negative, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think and we just have to be very careful about that. And that's something I think, I know Jeannie Duffy, who's our lead nurse, and Pam Shaw, we've sort of just started some preliminary okay. conversations with the Java-like staff in District 102 to kind of sort yes. some of those things through, but right. it is, you know, I've been trying to think about goals and purpose of this, and yeah. certainly just the general surveillance. So yeah. catch people before they're showing up in school, catch asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic individuals, right. potentially, right? Um, could it, I just wonder, could it support continuity of instruction in other ways? But I, I hear the caution, maybe, maybe it really wouldn't work well in that situation. I, I would just be interested in hearing what, what are the medical opinions on that, because yeah. again, from looking from the outside in with definitely imperfect information, mm -hmm. though it definitely seems like a couple recent situations, both with the NFL and with the White House, there are people who were testing negative and were transmitting the virus to others. Mm -hmm. At least it appears that way. Oh, I will say the White House is using the antigen test, which is an entirely different test than what's being suggested here. Right. Mm -hmm. Definitely different um, failure rate, and uh, those people were not wearing masks and distancing whatsoever. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, which we would never suggest. And the one thing that I think is useful about testing, um, we could offer those students that do not qualify for testing because there is a limited resource of tests in our area. If you only have one symptom with no contact, you are not always eligible for a test, especially if you're a child under 12. Yeah. And we could offer them that resource that would get them back in the classroom faster. So that, to me, is a benefit of testing. And in that situation, though, then that's what Dan is saying. We want to get medical yeah, I, I would want to want to see tests. what what is you know as, you know, as Jeff was mentioning well, the, yeah, the idea of false negative. Right. So, right. so I did research the U of I testing, which would only require the one test because there's a 99.8% with no false positives, and that would not require a second test. So that is an option that has been offered to us. Is obviously more expensive, but that is a difference in that in the one of two testing. Mm -hmm. And I did I did hear back from the University of Illinois just yesterday again and. Um, Right, as Sherry pointed out, the U of I is looking at a testing model that would maybe be $20 per test per person. Um, we're looking at what we think is going to be $11, or roughly $11, um, from, from District 102. Um, U of I, I think, has had just some scaling up issues um, that they were looking at creating some more local labs. He said now probably not until spring would they have more local labs. Um, they are looking at maybe some districts that would be willing to pilot with them early on. Even piloting, it would still be at that $20 per test per person. My sense is District 102, just being our close geographic neighbor and kind of almost, in some ways, almost holding a spot for us, um, is probably sort of the more, more plausible scenario at, at this point in time. Um, and I know, you know, we talked about the length of time, and we would certainly want to support District 102. They're, they will need to hire some additional staff, lab assistants to, to be then use, testing our samples, potentially some additional equipment. Um, so we want to be sort of true to our agreement with them. Um, I did ask how long they would expect us to engage in it, and, and Jeff and Joel, I don't know if you had the same conversation with Dr. Campbell. They said, until something better comes along, like if antigen tests are to come out and, and there's a sense that they're very inexpensive and they've increased on accuracy and, and we want to move in that direction, I think this is such uncharted territory for every school district and even for our society in many ways that we'll continue to think through options. I know even in my head, I think through how do we get through this school year and I know even as we start to think ahead, it could be on even into next school year. So. I think having a, the surveillance option, I think, could really um, be, be very, very supportive of, of the work that we're trying to do, and that is have continuity of instruction for our students. Especially when we saw the teachers um, in some Ms. Dozio's presentation, they are coming to work and uh, they are keeping our kids, you know, in, in, in school under these very restrictive conditions, obviously. But that's hugely important, I think, mm -hmm. to and I think this is a really a key element. In, in continuing that as we get into the fall and the winter, yeah. you know, where we don't know what's going to happen, uh, I really think this is an extra, an important extra layer that you know, is well worth the money spent. Yeah, if I if I had any request to do that, we could begin after the holidays with the early, I mean, at the latest, in my opinion, so that when people have been traveling, which we know they will, 
that we would have a baseline for knowing what's happening when we come back to instruction. Yeah, I would say as soon as possible. As soon as possible, obviously, but at a minimum, yeah. during that holiday season is extremely important. And so I, I really don't um, care either way which resource we use. I think they're both very reliable um, as far as their sensitivities. Can we function with both of these options? Yes. Um, cost is, of course, an issue and whether the lab works, but I, d I definitely appreciate the one or two option. And I think we have to, I think this is a responsible thing to do for our staff and our students. And at this point, should we kind of just go around and see like where everybody's at? So, so oh, I, I guess one, one question I do have though before we go around, are we, gonna, are we talking though testing all students, um, hybrid and remote, or? Well, I think Sherry makes a good point, and I know this is how 102 started out. They did just hybrid because those are the children coming to school potentially, you know, exposing COVID. So remote are not in that position. What I know District 102 has come to, you know, not understand, they know this, right, is that as they've looked at their capacity, they are looking at, and I'm not sure, Jeff and Joel, maybe you know if they're actually testing all, or offering it to all students now. We, I did, we didn't talk about that, so I don't know. I don't uh, know. My understanding was right now it's just the kids who are yeah. coming to school and either bringing their samples to school, depending that's, on, that's it, right. this depends on the right. yeah, age of the kid, but I think start. that's. You can build from that, uh, mm -hmm. but these are the people that are interacting with teachers, they're interacting, and they, we have to have an understanding of what's happening in our classrooms, and right now we have no understanding of what's, what's happening, what positivity rate is any. And maybe there's none, that'd be awesome, but um, I would totally support starting maybe at the hybrid. Uh, it seems most appropriate to start with the highest and potential risks, right. which is who's in the classrooms. Right. right, and I think Dr. Miller, they're using maybe the 96 sample machines. There's, there's only so many different uh, Yeah, that's what he said, right, the they machines, the so could have to deal with the capability of the machinery that they had and how many samples they can mm -hmm. process and would that require more machinery to help Right, there was an open question that he, uh, that that he said this like in terms of what they could do. Right, they we have that. to help with our machine that yes, well, we know. And that was some of what I was mentioning when he's thought through the logistics of this and what is the capability of the machine and what machines are out there and where do you get the testing supplies right. and there's a, there's a in addition to the theory of testing, there's the whole portion of creating the factory that does the testing yeah. and the people and the machinery. And a supply chain for the materials is certainly valuable. And if you know, Dr. Campbell has that kind of supply chain access, even that, um, which I think he, he was worth describing that he does. Well, yes, that's right. He's, I mean, that's, that's a, key, a, a key to his ability to get supplies. Because right now, as you can imagine, the supply chains are very tight. Everyone wants to do these tests. Yeah. And so he's got, he's got long-standing relationships with companies mm -hmm. through his lab, and he says his lab manager you know, can twist their arm and get what they need, so that's really... Uh, so going back to David, um, the question you pose is, do you have an opinion based on that? I mean, are you posing the question for, you know... Well, I'm, I'm posing the question uh, two, twofold. I mean, Martha brought it up as an all, and I do, I guess, where we're, the approach we're going is, I mean, we're, we're taking on a public health initiative here. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. and I, I do think we need to do this, and I agree that it makes sense to test people who are coming to school all the time. But I also look at this as sort of a little bit broader, that you know, we, I do think that um, it would be beneficial if there's a capacity mm -hmm. to do it for all students, because I do know even, I mean, I see this. <laughs> I, mean, mm -hmm. I mean, I see the kids, that they do, there is intermingle. Yeah. And so I do think there is some benefit to that, especially if we are going to eventually be looking in that direction. Um, initially, I think let's get this going, yeah. okay? I, but I do think if the capacity is there, I do think we should seriously consider rolling this I out to all students. I agree with you about, um, and I think this is, I, I, I would support this expenditure, but my one hesitation is that we are the smallest form of government trying to fight a national pandemic. Absolutely. So I, I, I find this conversation quite ridiculous, to be quite honest, oh, yeah. that we should, that we seven, eight people should not be having this conversation. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we're trying to do it, um, I think it's a, a great expenditure and I, I'm, I, I would support this endeavor. However, it feels slightly uncomfortable to me that as a, a school district of resources, we can do this 
and there's other school districts that can't do this. Yeah. And so for me, that's my only hesitation, is that this should not be coming from us. No, no. I, I, I look, This should be coming from somebody else. Absolutely. But if it's not, then we have to take action. And, and I, I, and, and I'm I just at, had to get it off my chest. No, <laughs> that's my, I, that's I, my I, only. Linda, I completely agree. I'm looking at these projections that Jim put together <laughs> showing this. You know, we're looking at possibly two years doing this. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, that's like a million dollars. I mean, <laughs> our government, I mean, eight of us, we are very fortunate. And then when we're going to go to the taxpayers eventually one day and say we need more money, mm -hmm. we spent a million dollars because of this, because our government, because Donald Trump and Betsy DeVos, they all failed us on this. And this is just absolutely insane. I I'm, I'm, don't mean to be getting... But this is just insane. It's the loudest I've ever heard you talk. Yeah, I know. It's, it's like in, insane that we're talking about this yeah. at the school board. We're like the bottom of the chain of, the gov of all government agencies. Yeah. And we're having to deal with this. I, I, agree, I agree with what you're saying and, and what Lynn is saying. But the only thing I would say is I, I don't think uh, we will be doing this a year from now because I do think these antigen tests are they are coming out. Companies yeah. are producing them. Mm -hmm. They're going to be cheap, and so I think and widespread. And widespread. Yeah. I think there were questions about these projections as well, because there's an assumption that it's two years. Which I honestly do not think that would be necessary. And second, I, the, I don't know the assumptions about frequency of testing in these projections. Is this weekly or biweekly? So Jim used the projection eleven dollars per test per person weekly. Is that for every person? And not every person. It was a it was a high percentage. Um, to make the estimate. Uh, the uh, number of students that were hybrid that come into the school, and then every employee, even though not every employee comes into the school, would so probably be tested. So it's kind of conservative. Compliance with the 1,100 approximately hybrid students and the 200 something scale. And I think we also looked at probably starting, you know, at this point we've got a couple weeks at least to scale up. So I think this, it would not be this high, but I think we wanted to look at, you know, perhaps a more challenging scenario financially. Yeah, I, I thought this was definitely overly aggressive as far as, well, it's, it's yeah. conservative, yeah. conservative, yeah. conservative yeah. estimate, that's what I would say. As far as yeah. cost, it's, it's an aggressive number, but I don't, I really don't think two years is going to be necessary, and I hope they got it tonight. I oh. hope it's not, <laughs> not going to be necessary, but you know, it was supposed to go in April, oh, away in yeah. April, so you know, yeah. what, what, what are we doing? <laughs> and this so. can obviously be adjusted as, Antigen tests are Absolutely. Right. And then all of a sudden, this projection looks good. You know, good, good, good we're basically behind. taking on an unbudgeted expense. And yeah. so I think you know there was a question of how it would look in, in terms of our bottom line. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it, when it can stop, it can stop, right? And then it just right. stops. Right. And we just, we just sort of quasi approved a, a $368,000 expenditure for a sewage pipe that's going to run from central to the street. You know, it's like, I mean, it's just, let's put it in context here, right? <laughs> it's like, right. No. we're talking about saving potentially reducing transmission in our schools on the one hand mm -hmm. for, you know, versus a ridiculous pipe. We're, 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 we're not. Those students are not very right. horrible, but I hear what no. you're saying. Yes, but the, th the, thing, the thing is, we shouldn't have to be doing this. Well, I, I, we, I, I mean, agree. we shouldn't agree. have to be doing this. That's, that's, and, and I'm not arguing with you about that, but I'm just, we're, we should not have to be doing this. And this is just infuriating. I, I'm sorry. I, okay, I know I'm not, no, this is just infuriating. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I understood. Well, understood. So should we just go at this point go around the room yeah. and see if there's general support to move forward this program or not? I mean, we're not voting on anything here, but no, we would at least like to. No, no, but we would at least like to give the administration. You know, if there's if there's more people who don't want to go forward with it, then there, there, you know, then we don't need to waste. Well, time would this be us. like we'd be basically saying we'd be directing Martha to 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 basically pursue this and get it going. And, and get the contract. That's my understanding. I'm, I'm not even sure they would set up a contract with us. I mean, right. I, I well, think that there's a bit of a gentleman's agreement. We would pay agreement. them for the services. Okay. Yeah. But you know, the first step to me would be communication to parents and staff that yeah. this is an option, and yeah. then there would be working with parents and staff to get the waiver consents for the testing, mm -hmm. and then to kind of move forward right. with so, you Several know ordering process, supplies, yeah. materials, and starting the process. So. Um, if the board's comfortable, you know, again, seven people well, need to weigh in, and then I don't know that it requires a formal action. We could probably set something up at the October board meeting if that would be. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't well, necessarily so care if there's a formal action. Before, before we get to the idea, though, of taking a, hand, a show of hands poll, I guess, I don't know, Wes, I don't know that I've heard your thoughts on that. <laughs> no, that's what I meant. Was, yeah. I had conversation from each person. Yeah. Comments. Uh, I mean, I think there's a lot to, I mean, a lot of this needs to be 
figured out, but I'm in support of it. Um, I think my main concern is, are we gonna have similar or higher numbers? Because if it's only 50% of the people, is this just a waste of money? Mm -hmm. um, so like, what's the... the like you mean if there's only 50% of families consenting to do it? Yeah, yeah. And, and I don't know, I mean, it's, it's gonna be hard to send a, I mean, you could send a survey out tomorrow and who knows whether that's even relevant or not. Um, so I think, you know, if we do it, you do it for a couple weeks, we gotta figure out if you do it one, you do it two, is, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, in general, yeah, I think we should at least move forward with the conversation. It is a lot of money, but I think even, uh, even to, to Jeff's point about preventing spread with just one, one more layer of protection, I think the, the potential for, uh, kind of going back to the beginning, like every sniffle, cough, sneeze, and everything causing children to be working remotely for 10 days, like, my kids cannot do that. Like they just, it's just not a good environment for my children personally, and I, I don't think I'm unique in that. So um, I would like to do anything possible to help keep kids in class uh, for their learning. But then also the disruption of, let's just say you have three sniffles throughout the year. You're in school, you're out of school, you're in school, you're out of school. Like that's just not very stable for, for especially for the smaller students, um, but even for the middle schoolers. So mm -hmm. I, de I definitely think it's something that we should move forward with and, and kind of iron out details as we go. And um, I, I mean, I don't know, you know, six months into it, maybe we call it quits or maybe we ramp it up, but yeah. I think we should at least start it. Joel, we've heard a ton from you. I don't know if you have anything. Uh, I mean, the points that, were, that have been made are good. I mean, David's got a great point, but <coughs> here we've got an opportunity to take control of the little bit of our world that we can take some responsibility for, and I think we should be moving forward with this. And when I say moving forward, I mean, I think we assume that we'll get 70% participation of our population, and mm -hmm. that Martha should engage with 102 and get on their, um, get in their schedule. I don't see that we're going to have significantly different participation than the community next door. They have similar economics, they have similar demographics. Jeff, I don't know what you think. Uh, well, you know, I agree, I agree with everything Cole just said. <laughs> yeah. I, I think uh, the editor at the Landmark said it very well, which is, you know, we are lucky because this opportunity fell in our lap. Yeah, Most, it's not, it's not every district that has this opportunity handed to them. And so I think, you know, for us to not to take it, given it has been like, it, it would be, I really think we should do this, really think so. Mm -hmm. Personally, I, I'm still very much on the fence on this, in this regard. Um, I, I mean, the, the, what I have in front of me that I'm certain about are the costs. I, what I'm uncertain about is the proposal, the degree of accuracy or the relevancy of what the results that we get. Uh, the, I, I was more in favor of this until these recent issues or incidents that came up with the NFL and, and with, uh, in Washington as well, where you have people who were asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic, testing negative, getting lax, letting masks down, and, and then having super spreader events come out of that. I would really, I am really concerned with the possibility of sowing in the community a false sense of security. Uh, and then having people drop their guard as a result. Uh, I, I definitely agree with what Linda has said in, in regards to it. it should not be us doing this. This really should be the public health department or somebody. <laughs> it really seems amazing that it falls to us or falls to local school boards to take action on something like this. Uh, it does give me unease, is this our mission? Uh, it does it could, you could definitely make the argument that it contributes to uh, education if, if it's allowing students to stay in school and stay in class and our hybrid classes to stay open. Uh, I would definitely have to see what this proposal adds up to uh, and in terms of the scientific weight or in terms of what are we actually buying? What are we getting by spending this money? Uh, as, as of now, I'm, I'm personally on the fence. It sounds like they're definitely outside of me. There is a consensus to move forward. 
like to point out that the uh, folks in Washington did not get lax because of testing. <laughs> they have never taken any precautions and used <laughs> testing, so I don't, so I just... just right, and I, mm -hmm. I think that would be just a communication and education piece, too, yeah. that, that mm -hmm. this does not change any procedures we've set up. This is just right. another yeah. layer of, yeah, which, and this yeah. I hear what you're saying, Jim. Our mask wearing, social distancing, I mean, those are our State Board of Ed requirements, so we're going to yeah. be unwavering about that. Um, I, I hear what you're saying, Dan, is would it make people then yeah. outside of school feel like, hey, we had a test, we're good, mm -hmm. um, but in, in school, uh, absolutely, it would, it would not change things. Mm -hmm. I think you know where me and Sherry Did we, uh, we have a question? Yeah, I just, um, I, I said this even from the summer, being on the pandemic committee, I just said, Martha, is there any way we could we get testing? And at the time, it wasn't available, and we kept hoping for something. And I am very thankful to Martha for taking the time, because it's a lot of time for her to reach out to the superintendent and to you all. I do appreciate her time on this. Um, you know, we love to call teachers kind of essential workers, and I think we should treat them as such and give them the testing that they deserve and our students as well. Um, if we're going to make the move to hybrid learning above 5%, which was my kind of recommendation that we wait until it's at a certain number, I think we need to support them with testing that can at least allow us to find these high viral load asymptomatic characters. Mm -hmm. That's the goal and that's the issue with the LAMP test and the PCR test, and that's what they're good at. And I promote any type of testing that would help us find those people that would be spreading without our knowledge. And you would never know it because they wouldn't look like it when you see them. Um, so I'm, of course, in support of this. And I would also like to remind people that uh, anonymity would be of utmost <coughs> importance and would be followed. This would not be something that the district would uh, share. Uh, they would be, I'm assuming, a number that would be destroyed, and this would not be an issue. And the same as the U of I testing, if we went with that ever, uh, that goes immediately to the Department of Health that would never go to anybody but the individual family. Mm -hmm. So it is of utmost importance that we maintain anonymity for those people as well. I would say that when we, uh, Martha and I discussed this with our parent leadership team um, a few weeks ago, there were a lot of questions about that, like anonymity and does this go on my, my child's medical record? Um, so I, I do know that while there's support, there are a lot of questions and education we need to make sure we do with the with our community to make sure all of those are answered. Because there were way more questions about things like that than I was anticipating. So I think that- Yeah, so, so um, uh, I think it's a good question. I think it's valid. I know that uh, Dave has concerns about that. It, um, the way they handle it at 102 is that they have a barcode that's sort of uniquely identified to the student, but you, you don't, wouldn't know that. And the only person at 102 who has the mapping between the barcode and the name is the nurse, and mm -hmm. they deliberately restrict that to the to the nurse as you know, but it's not doesn't go into medical record or anything like that. Yeah. No, and we would let the Department of Health manage um, as right. we currently do. If, if there's someone that has positive, we uh, you know we deal with the Department of Health and let them do their normal tracing. Yeah. And another thing that um, a parent brought up in that meeting was just the social emotional issues around this and the anxiety for children, to, you know, young kids providing tests and if there's anxiety created around that or any social emotional issues related. So I, I know those were some concerns the parents had. So that would just be another level of education and um, parent support we need to provide. And I'm appreciative that this would be a saliva test, which is so much easier to administer than a nasal swab for a child. Um, and even for us, I mean, come on. Yes. So as you know, I'm in total support of this, and I think it's a responsible thing to do. Thank you, Martha. And I think they're doing K through six, or yeah. um, giving their samples at home, pr developing, providing their samples, drooling, spitting into their yeah. cup at home. Mm -hmm. I think they were doing some of it at school. I know they did a kind of a roundup before school even started, and people come to an outdoor event. Um, I think by doing it at home, it certainly hopefully cuts down on children feeling anxious or awkward about it um, in the school setting. I think they're having middle schoolers test at school, um, but I think they're even looking at that as potentially something. I just wanted to mention it publicly yeah. as, as parents, when you mentioned the idea, those were some of their concerns that they had. So those are things we have to. I've said my piece, so. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think we should do it. Uh, I, the costs do bother me. 
the effectiveness, as was Leslie brought up, if, if we don't get a, a significant participation, does concern me. But I do think we should start looking, moving forward, and then start working out the details regarding like privacy and, and how we're going to handle this. Well, it sounds like there's general. Generals. Yeah, general, 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 general consensus, I would say. So, so is it okay? Like, I, I may plan a communication even to, for the early next week, and mm -hmm. if people are watching, you know, paying attention to this, then uh, we'll, we'll get the word out. Thank you. We've got local press as well, so mm -hmm. there's multiple paths of communication mm -hmm. that we have available to us. I don't think this is going to make it in. <laughs> <laughs> I can't hear you. Right. I can't hear you. I'm like, oh, sorry. Right. I was just making a smart joke. I'm not a smart joke. Don't well, was it funny? I don't know. Uh, All right. <laughs> it was made with a smile, so it was funny. It was, uh, right. uh, that is, if, if we are done with all the personal committee has. Now we get to move on to um, this fun, small topic policy. All right. Policy. Right. Policy. David, I want to hear your voice. <laughs> Should, we, uh, your Should we lower the disco ball and give it <laughs> <laughs> I want that intensity. And you have to, uh, all right, I'll, I'll try to give you that intensity. So we're, we're going to, I'm going to do the first reading, and then we can, uh, I've talked, Martha and I spoke, and we've, and, um, we've come up with how we'd like to proceed, and so we can yeah. go through that. So um, pull out your uh, headphones and, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, first reading is uh, press, uh, press Plus Memo 105. Uh, policy 2 colon 260 uniform grievance procedure policy 2 colon 265 title 9 sexual harassment grievance procedure it's new policy 5 colon 10 equal employment opportunity and minority recruitment policy 5 colon 20 workplace harassment prohibited policy 5 colon 100 staff development program policy 5 colon 220 substitute teachers policy 5 colon 330 six days vacation holidays and leaves policy 7 colon 10 equal educational opportunities policy 7 colon 20 harassment of students prohibited policy 7 colon 180 prevention of Prevention of and response to bullying, intimidation, and harassment. Policy 7 colon 185, teen dating violence prohibited. Um, now press one, press memo number 104. Uh, there's only one, and that's policy 7 colon 345, use of educational technologies, student data, privacy, and security. And that one's new. So Martha and I have talked and I've, I've reviewed the policies. Um, and so, I don't know how, uh, how much you've looked at them, but uh, the, there's one, the new one, uh, specifically uh, 2 colon 260, Title IX, Sexual Harassment and Grievance Procedures. Mm -hmm. All the other policies sort of feed in, I'd say, feed into that one. Many of the changes are just now referencing that policy. And so, while there's not, per se, a lot of policies on here, it is, they are pretty, uh, uh, I'd say pretty, uh, pretty important. And so I'm actually going to be meeting with the attorney because I had some questions myself um, regarding these policies uh, next Friday. And so what I'd like to ask the board, unless you have some questions now, I'm, I'm willing to, we can discuss it. But what I'd like to ask the board is if you can give me any questions that you have about these policies, because I'm meeting, I think it's Friday, isn't it? I don't remember, but next week. So if you can get it back to me, you know, get to me a week, if you can review it within next week, give me any questions, and I can bring those up to the attorney. So you're meeting over the, um, the 2 colon 265, like the new? Well, all of these, right, but but it's All doing the Title IX. Essentially okay. right. Okay. Wait, correct me if I'm wrong. I think there was the one policy that was specifically attributed to Fransic rather than to press, and I, I guess I was just wondering well, that one was, that was right. Martha, can you probably explain a little bit? Sure. More? But it was essentially, the, they came out, we looked at it, and tailored it more to 
I think that one also in the actual press memo said you should review this mm -hmm. with your attorney, right. yeah. from mm -hmm. what I remember. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. So as David shared, these are really substantive changes related to Title IX. As a matter of fact, um, both Angela and Don have gone through some training over the summer months as required. We've made some modifications to our website already because there were some requirements by mid-August, even without board approval of the policies, there are requirements under the law that needed to be put into place. So um, there's also a required training for our entire administrative team, which we've set up for sometime, I think, in the month of October, sometime soon with our attorney. So um, law firms were sort of quick to point out that there were some things that press just hadn't come sort of fully up to um, the necessary agreements. And so there were revisions uh, proposed right, right away. And so those those are already incorporated into this review process. Angela, did you want to say more about this? I know Angela's been through a lot of the, the training. No, nothing more about the trainings and such. Um, are you going to, the policy, the reason why we're looking at Pandex versus Press um, is because, as Mark was saying, the, a lot of uh, law firms started looking at. A lot of law firms started looking at the different policies and Franzic actually was working with press on it. They made some suggestions to press that press did not want to take on. So as our attorneys, they're suggesting that we go ahead and use those. And that's why we're using Franzic's version instead of presses. Who would be our Title IX coordinator? So it would be Angela. And so, but sometimes it says, or a qualified person. Is that someone who's undergone training? If Angela were not available, with so, and I'll cover this and feel free to elaborate, Angela, that um, when there's an investigation, mm -hmm. um, so sometimes an investigation is something that a building principal is going to address. Yeah. Um, again, I think it's sort of a determination of more minor or more major issues. Um, and that is the reason why our entire team will be trained. Um, and essentially, I sit as um, only somebody that would hear an appeal. Okay. Thank you. Is there anything more? Than I guess in, in general as well, a question I had, and, and if, I, if I read it correctly, and definitely I'm not an attorney, so there's a chance that I didn't read it correctly, it's, it's high. But it seems like a lot of these policies are coming out of uh, what the, the 1972 law, and I guess I'm wondering what do we know, maybe that's not a question we asked, but is uh, why so much significant change for a law that's been on the books for what? You know, 50 years close to it at this point. That I don't have a question. I, I don't have an answer for that. I don't know, Angela. You said you're, it looks like you're going up there to say something. So <laughs> I don't have to. Oh, you don't um, have anything? No. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so I don't know the exact date, but just recently in 2020, um, the law was adjusted and changed. Uh, Betsy DeVos went through, changed some Title IX pieces. And so that's why we have to go through now after all these years, as you said, and adjust and make these changes to our policies as school districts. Um, the higher education school district, higher education had already taken on some of these things and taken care of them. It's now the K-12 schools that are, that we're seeing have to make these adjustments in their policies. This is just a response to like you're saying the Department of Education changing and their interpretation. This is not only, sorry, this is not only a Department of Education. No, not only, but This we, is also state of Illinois because yeah. anyone with yeah. a professional license has to go through the same, has correct. to go through additional No, no, training. correct, but now we have this new set of uh, changes just specific to our school setting, I think, so. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it, 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 you're right, I think you're right as well. So you guys, it's interesting actually history of Title IX, because um, originally, as you said, it was just um, mainly intended uh, to prevent uh, sexual discrimination in, in uh, uh, collegiate sports, basically. Mm -hmm. It's really more for a lot of the years, uh, and it was a big one of the big changes was under the Obama administration and lots of civil rights in the education department, and they started to use Title IX uh, to basically um, uh, reduce um, uh, sort of on, on college campuses. They used that as sort of a vehicle to sort of monitor what was happening with sexual assault on college campuses. And so it's been, it's been a political football for about a decade right now, but that was the most recent. <laughs> sort of change that um, mm -hmm. I think. The most recent past. The most recent, yeah. <laughs> and then it sort of gone, went the other way and it's sort of, uh, but it's, there's a lot of, it's a lot of interesting 
fits there, and, and not all of it's, uh, there, there's no clear <laughs> um, analysis, I think, or that it is e it's not easy to sort of parse how it should be interpreted. And, mm -hmm. um, I think both sides are. So one thing I would also like to note is that because it's, these are substantive, we're, we might not, I don't think we'll maybe necessarily be approving them in the next board meeting, but possibly then in November, just for, so that we have time to make sure we get this right and uh, answer any questions we have. I think that's long, yeah. Seem to be like footnotes to yeah. tie this up. Yeah. Okay. All right. The poli policy committee rest. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, then uh, the next item is uh, future meeting dates uh, October 21st, uh, 2020. A regular business meeting at 7 p.m. in the Hauser Auditorium. The board will enter into closed session at 6.30 p.m. if necessary and return to open session at 7 p.m. Uh, November 4th, 2020, Committee of the Whole Meeting, 7 p.m. in the Blythe Park Gym. And that's, that, can, that confirmed? If the board is comfortable with, this, with these alternate arrangements, I, I think Blythe Park Gym would give us about the same amount of um, distancing, maybe even a little more, but um, again, sort of following our our plan to rotate to the different schools, we'll do that unless people feel that the Hauser Auditorium is a easier place to be with all of our social distancing. No, honestly, I think we have better um, acoustics in these rooms than the auditorium. I, I, I went around is difficult, yes. Yeah, I, I find this to be much more uh, conducive to have a conversation yeah, than the auditorium. Totally agree with that. And the other thing is, we, I mean, we can change with the, with the appropriate notification, we can change our location it's sort of always been regular business meeting is at Hauser. We moved to the auditorium just for the distancing, um, the traveling to the schools for a cow. But if, I mean, we now have accessibility um, in all of our schools. Gym or the Hauser cafeteria, as opposed to the auditorium if we're in that spot. We could do the cafeteria. The cafeteria is probably similar to this. What about yeah. the yeah. central multi-purpose room? The central multi-purpose room, we can meet there now. So we would do that oh, when yeah. it's the central cow but we could we could also Can do I the central multipurpose room. I'd like to suggest that we use the central multipurpose room for the next regular business meeting. Right. It still puts it on the central house or campus. That's very traditional, but probably a room with slightly better acoustics and personnel arrangement yeah. than just the auditorium. The auditorium yeah, just I really is too difficult. I don't want to confuse the public when we have this private and regular procedure going for a regular meeting there, and at least it's the same campus. I think that sounds good. And doors are yeah. it's right each other feet. Right, we can put signs on the, not, again, not that we have a lot of public visiting, especially during this time, but. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody's shown up anyway, so. Yeah. <laughs> this is almost the same size as the LRC at our cover, too. Yeah. yeah. The configuration allows us to go this way. Yeah, I was just going to say, it does, yeah. it's a little bit, yeah. So do we want to have the next meeting at the central multipurpose room? The, the regular yeah, business meeting. Is it wide enough? And is it, I, I'm just trying to think, is it wide mm -hmm. enough? I think it's, wide as wide as this. Yeah. it's as wide well, as this. It's as wide as this. You know, review it. It's not yeah. 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 I'm just really concerned about the auditorium. And yeah. if we do do the auditorium, it would have to be a different setup than the stage and the floor. It would have to be like up the aisle or something. Right. <laughs> is it hard for us to engage with each other? The lighting's better, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, maybe that's it. I do like having the microphone. <laughs> Actually, we talked to Don. Those, those are portable microphones, and I know people talk with their mask on. It is a little bit hard, so we could use the microphones for the added amplification, regardless of our location. All right, so should I revise these? Uh, so it's sounding like October 21st, 2020, regular business meeting, 7 p.m. in the 
what central multipurpose room? Is that what we're we're thinking? That's that's the way we're headed if to it tonight. Works, yes, please. Yes, it works. Okay. Uh, board will enter into closed session at 6:30 p.m. if necessary, and we'll return to open session at 7 p.m. Yes. November 4th, 2020, committee of the whole meeting, 7 p.m. in the Blythe Park gym. Uh, November 18th, 2020, regular business meeting, 7 p.m. in the central multipurpose room. Uh, the board will enter into closed session at 6.30 p.m. Okay. if necessary and return to open uh, session at 7 p.m. All right, and that is the end of my list here. And if there is nothing else, this meeting is adjourned.